Hello, uh, my name is Artan Sheshmani. I'm a, an associate professor of mathematics. Um, the kind of mathematician I am is an, I'm an algebraic geometer, and uh, in particular, I do Gramma Witten theory and Donaldson Thomas theory. And I often use algebraic geometry techniques to, uh, so to speak, uh, prove a statements, uh, some of them sometimes basically motivated by string theory. Uh, at this point at the Institute, uh, other than my uh, research, I'm working on several papers and uh, with collaborators, and other than my research, I'm lecturing, I'm actually, I've started teaching a special lecture series on Donaldson Thomas invariance, Donaldson Thomas theory, and uh, Gramma Witten theory. And basically, the goal behind these lectures is uh, to, so to speak, go over my work with collaborators during the past six to seven years since I um, graduated, uh, where we kind of studied different uh, moduli spaces of sheaves and calculate certain invariants for them, called Donaldson Thomas invariants, and prove uh, a certain property of these invariants, uh, which is called modularity property. I would like to tell you what does modular mean? What does a Donaldson Thomas invariant mean? What does a modular moduli space mean? Or how are they uh, actually at all related to string theory? So, the story is that um, I can I can just explain it in an example, which is what I often do when I'm asked this question. Um, in principle, um, in so to speak, in classical mechanics, if you have some particle which goes from point A to point B, or a state A to state B, and it traces out some path. So you, you can imagine that you have this dot-like object and you're drawing a curly path from a wall, let's call it the state A, to a wall B, and you would like to calculate the work done by the particle traversing this trajectory going from here to there, or the energy consumed by the particle. And in classical mechanics, I mean, you can just integrate certain function which gives you a measurement of basically rate of energy you would require per, per, per unit of length on this path. You integrate this function on this um, path and you will be calculating the required energy. Um, so what happens is that the difference between um, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, so to speak, is that if you have quantum particles going from state A to B, there are not, there's not just one path that the particle to, could take by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which we have all heard about it. Um, there are several possibilities. I mean, the particle could, could, could take any paths, many paths, and there's just, uh, you can't tell which path precisely, but you can say, you know, you could basically say it could be taking many paths, and each of which come with a kind of a measure kind of associated to the path, which gives you the data of what are the chances of taking that path. So if you're asked the question of how to calculate the energy uh, or work done by the particle going from A to B, these are quantum particles, there is this uh, notion of Feynman path integration um, formalism, which actually tells you how to calculate this quantity, which is basically you would imagine that you have many possible paths going from A to B, and you would associate to these paths, you parameterize a function which associated to each single path, this integrand that you could have integrate over the path and calculate the energy, plus some probability measure. So, you can calculate how much of energy each path is worth of and what are the chances of digging that path. And the total energy for the system, quantum, quantum system to evolve from state A to state B is by taking the sum over all of these and in some sense taking the average. And this is the most intuitive thing and this Feynman path integration formalism actually was induced, uh, introduced by Richard Feynman who is one of the best uh, physicists of all time, we all know. So. So basically this is what happens and, uh, and so now the geometry of, uh, so the difference between Feynman path integration formalism and uh, classical mechanics is that now you need to integrate these functions over the family of paths. And in mathematics we have a rigorous way of thinking of a family. Often families could become spaces. We call these things moduli spaces. These are spaces 
each point of which correspond to one of these paths and so we integrate things over these moduli spaces to, to be able to eventually calculate the, what is called the free energy of the strings going from a state A to B and now how is that related to the work of the algebraic geometer it has to do with the very fact that as uh, quantum gravity, basically the merger between quantum mechanics and gravitational theory actually happened and the string theory was offered as a model, one of the dilemmas and the problems was that was that when you're integrating, when you're adding the gravity to the, to the picture, somehow your integrand will have the metric of the path on it and if you're thinking that two particles coming together and they diverge off, this path that they shape, that, that they, they trace, will become singular and you need to smoothen it this is called renormalization and it just turns out that if you think of objects as point like objects you need to be doing this infinitely many times basically to the very Lagrangian of this path you need to add infinitely many terms and that's not possible so it was then suggested in a string theory that we can change our perspective and think of the tiniest particles in the universe, what is inside the atoms and cores and so on, as a curve. So now imagine that you have a curve and it traverses some path in the space-time and it just gives you, it traces out a two-dimensional surface, like some tubular surface. And even the curves, if they come together, they can glue to, get glued to each other kind of smoothly. And maybe I can draw it in here, you will get some picture like this like that and you know something like that whereas previously if you thought of point like object the path that you will get will be something like this and you have singularities in these uh, locations so if you think of objects as curves you could get something like this some two-dimensional tubular surface it could have holes like what you've seen inside the donuts and we these are what we call Riemann surfaces of given number of holes which we call in mathematics genus so this is where algebraic geometry comes in where it just comes motivated by I mean it's just motivated by string theory that we need to be integrating certain functions over the moduli space or the family space of objects like this and one of the the basically consequences of wanting these to be these uh, basically um, theory, the quantum field theory that you associate to this picture, wanting it to be uh, so to speak supersymmetric or conformal field theory is that uh, you would like first of all you would like these Riemann surfaces to be given by uh, pseudo holomorphic curves and you would also like them to be embedded inside some ambient Calabial uh, manifold which is a six dimensional manifold so Donaldson Thomas invariants are basically so to speak roughly speaking Euler characteristics of these moduli spaces and certain numbers that you associate to these moduli spaces and so we can calculate them, then the lecture series basically discusses how to calculate these numbers and also when you change the parameters to topological data of the Riemann surfaces you can calculate further and further of these Donaldson Thomas invariants and the lecture series is discussing about whether there is a certain symmetry between the infinite sequence of numbers that you get this way and these are uh, formulated in the context of modular forms and if you know that your generating series of these Donaldson Thomas invariants are modular which is what we have been proving during the past seven years basically that gives you all the information about um, so to speak that theory without really needing uh, supercomputers and so on to calculate each number by just looking at the patterns and the symmetries between the proving that there exists a symmetry between these numbers there is a pattern between these numbers you can just find a generic formula that calculates all the coefficients in this generating series so I hope that uh, you guys actually can come to the lectures if you're a string theory theorist or an algebraic geometer <laughs>